All right, Dynasty is done. Now I'm kind of talking quiet because it is late. I don't want to disturb my neighbors. But let's make this clear. You see my title. Did they prove their back? Uh, no. I'm saying it for me personally. I'm going to elaborate more. But do I believe that AEW is back? No. But it does not mean that's a bad thing. Let's go through the show. Zero Hour. We had three matches. Now, the first match is the only one that really felt really important as a story. Because let's make this clear. The majority of the show really did not have a lot of story behind many of the matches. Yes, we had some really good matches, but the storytelling was very lacking to a certain extent. This one is the only one that had a real story. Now, it's not the fact that um, the first match and the second, for that matter, were super important, but it's about what it meant. We got Trent versus Matt Seidel, and the match with Trent Beretta came out pretty well. It did. And at the end, Trent Beretta did a tap out on Matt Seidel, which you don't usually get on Matt. And then when Brian tried to check up on his brother, he got his ass nailed as well. And then we see a little bit of Chuck, where Trent made it very clear. You know, I've been trying to contact you. You don't want to talk to me. You're acting like a damn prick. So I'm giving you to Wednesday to talk to me, or we're done. And then we get Shabata with um, Orange Cassidy. This, I think, is one of the most important things that's on the kickoff, well, the zero hour next to the tag titles being combined. But that's about just combining the tag titles. I mean, the trios titles, not tag, the trios titles. This is a real story compared to Acclaimed and um, the Bang Bang Gang. That, that That's not as important as this. Because since I said more than a, almost a year ago, at least nearly a year, they've been teasing on and off that Trent Beretta is going to turn. And now that he has turned, the question is where they're going to go with it as much as they finally went with it. Will they let Trent get a win over Orange Cassidy and get possibly get somewhere? That's going to be the big question. I don't know, but you get my point. Sabata and Orange Cassidy versus a Shane Taylor and Lee Moriarty. Now, I want to say this. It really didn't mean much here, other than Shibata and Lee Mori. No, Lee Moriarty and Shibata has some okay chemistry. Shibata with Shane Taylor look pretty good. They also got chemistry. But when you look at Shibata and Orange Cassidy, they look like they should be a tag team. Honestly. I think that's why I think they should go with Orange Cassidy and Shibata. And that's why I think what they're doing with Shibata and Orange Cassidy, that they're together. At least on this match. I think it should be that way. But this is just me. Let's make this very clear about all three of the matches. They were not bad matches. But this was not about the matches. This is about whatever story you had. The first match had some story. The second match elaborated a little bit more with the... the Commenters, well, commentators adding to it. The third match really did not have a huge story behind it. I'm sorry, it doesn't. Yeah, they had one moment when they had Jay White with a Billy Gunn, but now it's not about that. This is about what I've always believed they needed to do, like most people do. They should start combining these titles and making the Undisputed or at least retiring some of these titles. If you don't count... The RH six man tag, you have 14 titles across AEW. 14. That is a lot of freaking titles, and they need to slim that damn stuff down. So, when you see this match with the acclaim, when it's called the Undisputed AEW Trios titles, I'm like, finally. They even mentioned it, they actually forgot to say it. And that was not good, but at least they did mention it. And that was the most important thing to me personally. I didn't care about the story. I cared about them combining those titles. That is all that mattered to me. Nothing else mattered. 
I didn't care if the acclaim retained, and I didn't care if the sit the the not the sit gang, but pretty much the bang bang gang. I didn't care. All that mattered was combining those damn titles and slimming down the divisions. It's just too many divisions, and it's screwing up all of the company. It just is. It doesn't matter if you go for the developmental, dynamite, rampage. Collision, you got too many damn titles and they're not exclusive to any brand because they got none. So once the Bang Bang Gang won, I was like, finally, a retired set of titles. The only thing they need are new branded titles to get rid of those, those, those six of them and I'm cool. So I'm hoping when Wednesday rolls around, they will be given new titles. Yes, Tony goes on screen. I don't care. Let him go on screen. Let him get those titles. And I don't give a fuck as long as they get them. Let's move on. Main card. Continental Championship. Pac versus Okada. I thought it would be further up on the card. Honestly, I thought the House of Black with, with Eddie, Mark, and the Adam Copeland would be the one to open the show. No. They opened the show. And I'm like, um, okay. I kind of think it's not the right spot for it, but okay. And let's make this clear. Did Okada look good? Yes. Did Pac look good? Yes. Did the crowd cheer for for their Pac? Their bastard. Hell yeah, Pac is so damn over. This is my boy. Pac is my boy. I've always said one of the most favorite wrestlers I got in AEW is Pac. And it is him and it shows. People are calling him their, he's their bastard. You don't get that often other than MJF. Like he's our scumbag. They embrace Pac after he lost and I expect him to lose. There's no way they're going to let Okada lose. Not now. It's too soon. He just got the title. It's his first defense. There's no way he was going to lose. His real major defense at a real pay-per-view. So they weren't going to let him lose here. And did he look good and menacing in the match? Yeah, he did. Did he look a little sloppy in some cases? Yeah, but it wasn't that bad. But the thing that got me is when they embrace Pac. That made me happy. Next match was House of Black versus Eddie, Mark, and D. Adam Copeland. Did I believe they were going to win? Actually, I did. I actually thought Adam Copeland would probably get the pin on Malachi Black. I thought that would make the most sense. But Malachi Black was the one that got the pin on Adam Copeland after spraying him in the face. I don't know if I got that shot. I probably don't. I don't even know if I'm going to put any images. Actually, I don't think I will. I don't think I'm going to put any images in here. So, sorry, guys. So... Unless, um, that maybe one or two. But he did get sprayed in the face. He did lose. But the question now is what's for the house of black? I can see Eddie still working with Mark and Mark working with Adam. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. They could be a trios group. They have chemistry together. They do. I actually like the chemistry they got. So if they're going to do something with them, I wouldn't mind it. They need more trios since now they just unified the titles. But what about Malachi Black? What about Brody King? What about Buddy Buddy Matthews? What are they doing with them? They just let them get a win over three champions. A continent... Well, I almost forgot. The New Japan Pro Strong Champion. He's not a continental champion, Eddie. The TNT Champion and Adam. And the ROH Champion and Mark. Unless they're going to have them each individually go at them to the, so they can try and take the titles from them. I don't see anything from the House of Black going forward. I don't see anything. It's just me. Tell me what you think. TBS title. We know there was no way that Julia Hart was going to retain. House of Black won. There was no way she was going to retain against Widow Nightingale. It just was not going to happen. I wasn't going to see it happen. And it wasn't going to happen. But I got to say one thing. Was this a good match? It was a bit sloppy. But it wasn't bad. And um, 
Maybe one of the few images I'll put in here if I'm going to put any images. Willow wasn't really paying attention. She was so focused on that damn match. She wasn't really paying attention to a ring attire that was showing a lot more cleavage than normal. Now, understand this. I'm not trying to sound like a degenerate old ass man. But I have to mention what you're going to see if you watch the show yourself or the paper for yourself. Because you're going to notice that when it came to Willow, you were seeing a lot more cleavage than you normally see. You see a lot more jiggle than you normally saw. And I'm hoping that you'll look past that. Now, I don't have to be even mentioning it, but no one does. It's not because it's a degenerate thing or some guy who's horny or something. It's that if you really want to get the experience of what's going on in this match, you got to know what's going on. You got to know how both women are working. When it came to Julia, she was sloppier than Willow Nightingale. But you can see that Willow was so focused on trying to make this match look as good as possible, her ring attire was showing a little more booby than normal, a little more jiggle than normal. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I thought you should at least know. And she won the match. And then we get Mercedes Monet, Miss CEO, coming out. And here's the thing. She looked great. She looked sexy. She looked great. But the thing that I kind of wish they had not done was this. I would have liked to see this on Wednesday's Dynamite. Because let's make this clear. Yes, we're getting double or nothing. And the moment that she did the CEO bit, she goes down to the ring, shaking her ass, gets into the ring. They immediately show the, the graphic for double or nothing. They're not even halfway not even halfway through the entire show, and they're already spotlighting double and nothing. I don't believe this was wise. And for me personally, it felt like a lost opportunity here. That it should be on Dynamite. They should be setting that up for Dynamite. Not doing it here. Now most people say, dude, I don't want to see that on Dynamite. Well, guess what? What would give other people interest to tune into Dynamite? Seeing CEO going there in the ring when Willow is basically about to talk to people. Now, I know it's formulaic, but it's more better that way because you're setting up past your current pay-per-view that you're in. You don't always advertise the next pay-per-view while you're in the pay-per-view. It's not always the wisest thing to do while a match is going on or when it ends. You want to set up, yes, for the next dynamite that will lead to the next pay-per-view, but not this. This just felt like it was forced. And it didn't take a full advantage of Mercedes Monet. I'm moving on. Next. I think one of the most hardest hitting. But to a certain extent. Second best story so far. From the kickoff. No, the zero hour. And the main card. Not talking about Swerve. Not talking about what happened with the Bucks or anything else. Or... or you know what I'm going to be coming up with when it comes to Brian and, and Osprey. But this was the next story. And this is O'Reilly versus Roderick Strom. They know each other, known each other for years. Well, two years I'm not seeing O'Reilly because of neck and possibly he's diabetic as well. From what people said, he may be diabetic on top of taking care of his neck. And he's finally back and they're doing the story that he didn't want to deal with the kingdom he wanted to make sure that he get his own worth but since Robert Strong didn't get what he wanted and wanted him to join and follow under him like the kingdom is because he would have been part of the kingdom not just be part of the undisputed kingdom he would have been part of the kingdom that's the way it looked so this is where we get this match it was the third most hardest hitting match there was the third hardest hitting. I don't care what anybody says. This was it. The third one, this was it. It was that physical. And you felt exalted along with Kyle O'Reilly and Roderick Strom. In the end, Strom won. Now the question is, what are they going to do with O'Reilly? I don't know. But they're going to keep going with the kingdom. They're going to keep going with Undisputed Kingdom. And guess what? Now you got Adam Cole who can now walk. And he gave basically 
a stare that would give a thousand knives to the back of someone's head. And that was to Warlow. He's looking at Warlow like, you little bastard. You didn't get the job done. I'm going to make sure you pay for it. And this is what we got. Fine. Next. We got the FTW Championship. Now, this was an interesting match. This was Chris Jericho wanting to take the FTW title from Hook to teach him a lesson. And when you look at the entire match, and it was a good match. Let me give it to you like this. This was one of the best matches I've seen Hook do so far. Because this wasn't about being the better wrestler. This is about trying to tell a story that someone wanted to teach you. And you are trying to show that you're just as good as them. And you don't want to disappoint your dad because his dad was there. This was also about his dad who was on commentary, who was upset and uncomfortable about this. And it was good. And seeing that Hook was struggling with Chris, showing he was resilient, but he was struggling, was good. Seeing he took not one Judas effect, not two, but three Judas effects, and then, was it three Judas effects? No, sorry, two Judas effects and one bat to the face, which totally wiped his ass out because this was FTW rules, anything goes. They had everything in there. They had kendo sticks. They had garbage can. You got a suplex with a garbage can on top of Chris Jericho's head. That probably didn't feel good. But once Hook lost, the key of this is what happened next because Chris didn't act all cocky and happy. He acted very upset. He did not want to do what he did to Hook. He said, I'm sorry. I love you. Please. Kind of doing what... Well, it, it's kind of reverse of what happened with Undertaker. No, not Undertaker. With Shawn Michaels with Ric Flair. The reverse of it. He didn't want to do it to someone he wants to teach. Unlike someone who had been taught by someone like Ric Flair. And he loved him. That's what Hook got. And seeing that... Well... Let's make it clear like this. A part of me really wishes Taz could get back in the ring. I would love to see Taz get his title back. I'm going to be honest here. I don't want to see Hook get the FTW title. But I wouldn't mind seeing Taz go in the ring for the FTW title against Chris. But since Taz, I I know he'll never get back in the ring because of his neck. And it, it just feels like he needs to be in that ring. That's the way it feels. But this is what we're going to get. He went to the back with Hook because, of course, that's his son getting whacked in the face. Of course, he had to. So it makes perfect sense. Now, moving on. Next match. Thunder Rosa versus Tasteless Tony Storm. My Tony Storm. My girl. My, my Miss Miss Talkie actress. In other words, if you don't know the talkies, if you've been a movie buff, if you're a movie buff, what I'm talking about is when the 1920s, early teens in the 1920s, they had no sound yet. Not until almost near the 1930s did they actually put sound with music, sound and replace the music that they used to use in places that had organs. You got Tasteless Tony Storm or Timeless Tony Storm. I have to, I have to educate you. Timeless Tony Storm. She was wearing all black, all white faced. And having powder in her hair. And red lipstick. They used to do that so you could be seen differently in black and white. Because they didn't have Technicolor yet. So. She did exactly what most actresses back then would do when they were on screen. She had to wear white on the face so you could be seen correctly. Wear as colorful lipstick as possible. Gets into the ring and then goes to work. With a Thunder Rosa, who was wearing a mask at one point, took that bitch off, and only had her eyes colored, not the rest of her face. Hmm. Was this a good match? Yeah, it was. Was it better than Willow and Julia Hart? Yes, it was. It was a better match. But I gotta say this. When you look at Thunder Rosa, she still looks like the type that wants to do the way she used to. The style she used to do. And she's trying to combine it with more power. And she's just not there. 
He's somewhere in between trying to be as fast and agile as possible. And just barely strong enough to get what you want done. She needs to go away from agile, be fast, but get stronger. That's what she should focus on. Strength now. That's just me. But the match was still pretty good. I was fine with it. It was better than Willow and 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 Julia Hart. Because yes, Julia did do pretty well. But you could tell the one who was really shining there was a Willow Nightingale. She's a better wrestler than a Julia Hart who has improved. But just there. In the end, with a little bit of help from... Well, Luther got involved a little bit. A little bit of Mariah May got involved. But in the end, we did get... Guess what? Our Tony Storm winning. There was no way I went to see Thunder Rosa win. There's no way. I, there's no way she was going to win. I knew she wasn't going to win. If she won, it would be a big mistake. You got one of the rare women who has been booked very well. Who has one of the most fun and interesting gimmicks they got. And you're going to actually drop the title to a Thunder Rosa who just came back. Whose gimmick is not really much developed other than what it was before she left. And she needs development. I'm just saying. Now, here's the match that got scary. Will Ospreay versus Brian Danielson. This was the best match of the night. If you're going to talk about how well the match was constructed, how fast paced it was, how well technical it was, this was it. It was not, this is not about a story. They say this is a, a dream match. That's what it was. It was only a dream match. That's what they focused on. This wasn't about if the legacy of Brian Danielson is in jeopardy or the rise of a Will Ospreay is about to take the, the shine away from Brian Danielson. No, this was just a straight out match to see who the best were. This was the best match. Not the best story, but match. So what we got here was very well done. But very, very, very scary. Because even though the crowd was going crazy, they were loving it. They say we were not worthy. We love this. This is awesome. Of course, all the stuff they normally do. Chanted for Osprey, chanted for Brian. It was the end of the match. When you see that, I can't remember what the name of that Tiger Driver is. Is it Tiger Tiger Driver 94 or 96? But when he got put right onto the back of his neck... You see Brian Danielson look completely fucked up. And then when he got that hit and blade, which I was concerned halfway through the the entire match. Because Will kept his elbow pad on. And the story was that he wouldn't take it off until he absolutely had no choice. Yes, you did get at least one or two hit and blade already to a Brian Danielson. One on the outside when he dove off when Brian Danielson was being checked. But I'm going to tell you this. When that hidden blade came out after he got dumped on the back of his neck. And he was just laying in the ring. And before that the ref is calling for the the dock. But Will didn't realize to stop because he was calling for the dock. And Will just nailed him really bad in the back of his head. That was scary. He could be perfectly fine. He could be just playing into it because they didn't call for... Any type of emergency. They didn't go like this. They didn't. So he looked. Generally. That part of. Probably him. Acting. No problem. But no matter. Even if it was fine. (sighs) He is nearing retirement guys. Understand. Brian Danielson last year said. That this year is it. He's not going beyond this. He will no longer be in ring competitor. He'll probably work in the back of AEW from now on. Working with the talent, working the maybe training them, coming up with storylines, stuff like that. He is not going to wrestle anymore. He's done after this. He said he's finished unless they're going to do one more match if they pull him out of retirement. But if he legitimately got hurt with this match, that is not right. That's going to suck. And seeing Will being afraid and worried after that, it's understandable. Second to last match, you got the ladder match. EVPs versus FTR to see who is the third AEW Tag Team Champions because this is the last match for the tournament. I'm going to tell you this. I knew the match was going to be fine. I knew there might be blood. And there was blood. 
and it was a damn good match, but I didn't care. I'm telling you right now, I did not care because of what they did, deciding to release that footage and then the Bucks trying to explain it and justify and then trying to make the story about them losing everything and Punk being what was with Punk. I didn't care. I didn't. It didn't matter to me. It was now just about a match to see who is the third AEW Tag Team Champions at that point. The story sucked. But by the end of it, and we see Jack Perry. I don't know if I got a shot. I don't even know if I'm showing images. I'm still debating right now. I'm actually, as I'm talking right now, I'm thinking, do I really want to put images in? It's already past 12. It's going to be 1. I'll be done by 2 to 3 in the morning. Do I want to do that? I don't know. But, seeing Jack Perry, I don't know if this was great. Yeah, the crowds went ape shit over it. They did. They went ape shit. Seeing Jack Perry, they they had the perfect right to. No one has seen him since last year after Hook and him had their match. No one's seen them. Other than the footage we just showed weeks ago. But wondering, did this work? Yes. Jack Perry helped the Bucks to win. And that makes sense. Storyline-wise, it does make sense because FTR is still friends with Punk and you want to see them get screwed over because Punk is the one that caused this mess as far as the EVPs are concerned. But will the story work? And seeing them, he goes into the ring with the mask on, grabs, I believe it was Cash, that grabbed him, escorted him out, does not mean this is going to work going forward. It could, but I don't know. For me personally, I didn't care about the story because it sucked the way the story had to be constructed. Punk did something, Tony and everyone else reacted, released a video they shouldn't have released, tried to make the best out of it by putting it into a storyline, and now the story has been ended. Jack Perry has shown back up. People may be excited, but I'm not. Why should I be? Why should I be excited over a story that should never been done? I'm just saying. Final match. Samoa Joe versus Swerve Strickland. The best story of the entire thing. I'm going to say this. The first of somebody is important. Swerves the first black man from America to win the AEW championship. And understand the relevance of that. But they didn't do that for Samoa Joe. They barely did that for a, remember, the first Jewish AEW champion in MJF. They barely did. MJF had to state it himself. And they didn't even talk about it in commentary saying, you see our new Jewish champion. They never do it. Joe, they didn't do it. But Swerve Strickland, because he's black, they did do it. That's a double standard. And I don't like that. You have one Samoan, one Jew. You don't even say how important that is. But you do with Swerve, which it offends me. But even though it does feel offensive to me personally, I can't deny it and I won't deny it because it was important. I just wish they had done it with the others. Match was very good. It was done very well. It was constructed very well. I got a little nervous at one point when Swerve kind of landed on the concrete the way he did. He looked like he might have hit his head, but he seemed to be all right and he won. But now here's the big question. Who will be Swerve's first opponent after he deals with Samoa Joe? Because it ain't over yet. It's not going to be over with Samoa Joe. He's going to want to get his championship back. He's going to want to. So he will be dealing with Joe for a bit longer. It's going to happen. But who will be his first opponent? Will it be Hangman Page? Will it be MJF if he comes back? I don't know. But I am interested in seeing who will be the first person after Samoa Joe when he gets a rematch. It will be quite interesting to see 
how far they're going to push a Swerve Strickland. They just put the entire company on his back and now they're going to let him run with it. The question is going to be, who are they going to pair him with to make sure that he can handle that responsibility, which it looks like he can, but he's got to prove it. Look, guys, like I put in my title, did they prove their back? No, they have not. This entire show felt like they were trying so hard to prove that they are back, that they proved they're not. Yes, they had great matches, but not much storylines. They brought back Jack Perry, yes, but the story that Jack Perry was brought back in sucks. Seriously sucks. The women's division is still not very strong. We still have 14 titles. Look. AEW Championship, RH Championship, the TNT Championship, the International Championship, the uh, Continental Championship, the RH Tag Championship, the, well, now it's not, yeah, the RH Tag Championship, the AEW Championship, now the Unified Trios Championship, the Pure Championship, the TV Championship, now the RH Women's Champion, the RH Women's Television Champion, the AEW Women's Title, and the TBS Title. That's 14 freaking titles that needs to be slimmed down. They got so much work to do. And they're like behind the eight ball right now. And I'm not saying that AEW is going out of business. They're not. Let's, let's make this clear. If TNA isn't gone, AEW is not going anywhere. They're not like... Turner with WCW, who is badly mismanaging it. They got TV deals, they're making good money. It's just the attendance is not very good in the arenas. They're just not. This one had great attendance in in St. Louis. It had great attendance. But normal shows, attendance is down. But that doesn't mean they're not making money. Like I said, these places are making money. But the question is, will you care? And do you believe... That they're back. I know people are going to say they're back. I'm not. I'm not going to say they're back. But I'm not going to not. I'm, I'm not denying that this pay-per-view wasn't good. It was very good. But it was very worrisome. How far they had to go to try and convince people. That this was them coming back. From what happened with CM Punk. And his statements. But this is just me. Peace.